Hello and welcome to Scripture of the Day. My name is Bobby Blakey, and I'm here to invite you to read the Bible. And what a joy it is to get into a chapter of the New Testament every day with you. We are praying for a revival. And today's chapter is Ephesians 2. Now, for today's chapter, I wanted to come down to the beach. In fact, this is where Scripture of the Day all began. And it's been a great journey to go on together. We've even taken some trips. We went to the Rock at Morro Bay. We went to Horseshoe Bend, a symbol of repentance there in that river. We just recently went to Northern California, the Bixby Bridge, where we saw the gospel. And then we went to Idaho to see my brother, Ben Blakey, and the work that God is doing at Compass Bible Church, Treasure Valley. Our biggest trip for the New Testament scripture of the day is yet to come. That's right, the whole scripture of the day team is going to Israel, coming up here, and, and, and we're so looking forward to that. But one thing I wanna say is while it's fun to go on trips, hey, check out this place where we get to live. Not exactly a bad spot here, everybody, that our church gets to gather together in Huntington Beach, California, and just a short drive from our building. Boom, you can be here with the sky, the wind, the waves, the sand, the beauty of God's creation. Man, if you live around here and you never get down to the beach, be a good steward of where you live and come and worship the Lord for the beauty of His creation. Even one thing that I always think about when I come to the beach, Jeremiah 5, where the Lord says that the, even though the waves look so mighty when they're hitting that, that beach, the power of the shore is more, that God has set a decree of where the shore is and the waves cannot rise against it. You see the power of God in his creation as he separates the land from the water. So it's always great to be down here at the beach and it's always great to be getting into Ephesians chapter two. And what a privilege it was for us to go over this chapter around the time of last Easter. And it starts with us being dead in our sins. And every one of us, we need to see ourselves inside of sin's coffin. That there is absolutely nothing we can do to do good works or to make ourselves alive spiritually. I mean, if you think of somebody being dead, right? God is the one who comes and makes us alive. So we want to break this chapter down into two sections. And the first one is in verses 1 to 10. But God... And these first 10 verses deal with us as individuals dead in our sins, but made alive in Jesus Christ. So this is God's work of regeneration. This is what we've been learning about, about being a new creation. And we looked at five reasons people go to hell in verses one to three, how it's describing us there in our lost, sinful condition, that we followed the course of this world, we were following the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan, we were living according to the passions of our flesh, all these different descriptions of our sinful nature and why we would be condemned apart from God, then we get to that beautiful transition, but God, and then it describes how he made us alive in Christ. Even though we were dead in our sins, he raised us up with Christ. He seated us in the heavenlies with Christ. And the way it describes the goodness of God, if we could go back and preach Ephesians again, I would do a whole sermon here on how it says, with the great love with which he loved us, or the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Do you see, I mean, Paul's just layering up words there. I mean, we're talking about a, a multiple layer cake here, so thick, it's hard to get your fork all the way through it. Is that a picture for you there? Anybody seeing what I'm saying? Multiple layers of frosting in between the layers of that just sweet cake. That's what it's saying. Like, hey, there's so much great love, there's the riches of grace, and, and then there's all this kindness. Like, he can't even really describe how good God has been to you that you were dead in your sin and God made you alive in Christ. It's all a work of God. Salvation is something completely that God does. You would be dead in your sin today, but God, because of his great love, his rich grace, and his kindness in Christ Jesus has made you alive. 
And so we praise God that we are saved and it's totally a work that he has done. And, and I just continue to rejoice of all the professions of faith I keep hearing about at our church, people I am blessed to talk to. But what really brings me joy at our church is when I hear about professions of faith in our junior high ministry and our junior high leaders are praying for the young people. I hear about professions of, professions of faith from our college ministry, getting out on the campuses and doing evangelism and people are professing faith. And so it's awesome to hear about how God is doing a mighty work that's so much bigger even than myself or our little church or even us as individuals. God's doing something amazing. And so we see God's mighty power to save. And why is God so mighty to save? Because he's so abundant in love. That's what we see here and so rich in grace. Now in verses eight to 10, Ephesians 2, eight to 10 is a passage you really should know. And I actually wanna make Ephesians 2, eight to 10 our memory verse for this week, everybody. And so it's three verses. So this is the ultimate memory verse trilogy challenge, everybody. So I know some of you have been doing the memory verses and I keep hearing the rhetoric about, well, I used to memorize easier when I was younger. Hey, these verses, are not only critical for your own soul, but they could be the difference when you're explaining the gospel to keep someone from being having false assurance in works righteousness. Because Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Everyone who is religious, besides those, I mean, they would call us religious, those of us who believe in Jesus. But everyone who is religious, they need to hear those, those verses. There's no boasting because it's nothing that you do. It's not a result of works. So if you think about being saved, saved is totally a work that God does. And, and it's not by our works. That's something we've got to totally understand about salvation. Everything we do is based on what Jesus has already done. And we're gonna get more of that at church this weekend in our Done series. But Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 don't end without verse 10. And I often say that verse 10 is the loneliest verse in the Bible, Ephesians 2, 10. Can you see that verse right here in my journal? Because you got verse 8 and 9, and they're kind of a no works click. And then you can see verse 11 is way down there, getting into the second section of the chapter. So verse 10 gets left by itself. But the truth is, when God does his work to save us, which is not by our works, God saves us for good works. So those of us who would know that we were dead in our sin, but we've been made alive in Christ, we should expect that life of Jesus and that rich, abundant grace to flow out in good works in our life. And that's what verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, referring to God's work of salvation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that's where we see that the Lord has a beautiful path for every one of us. And he wants us to take the next step of obedience. In fact, part of the reason that God saved us was there's good works he wants us to do, maybe spreading the gospel to more people so they can be saved. But there's good works that God wants us to do in this life. So we don't discount good works in the Christian life. They just come after God's work to save us. That's when we do the good works we've been created for in Christ Jesus. So how do good works work? It's complicated because they definitely don't work to get saved, but they are the overflow of our life in Jesus Christ to do good works. And so we've got to understand that in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. I encourage you to memorize it. But then we get to the second section of Ephesians 2 in verses 11 to 22. But now, and the second half of Ephesians 2 doesn't focus on our salvation as individuals, but on our collective salvation. It says in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one. So he's talking about the separation here between the Jew and the Gentile. And now everybody who's saved, we are all one in the body of Jesus Christ. So not only are we saved from death to life as individuals, but collectively, 
we're saved from all these different, different distinctions that we make as human beings based on gender and economical status and, and race or, or all these different things that people are being divided by that we're trying to overcome in this world. Boom, we're all made one. We're all brought near in the blood of Jesus. We're all blood brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what the rest of the chapter really gets into is this dividing wall of hostility between different types of people, Jew and Gentile. And we know that the Jews were really against the Gentiles. Jonah being a classic example, even a prophet of God who didn't want to go to Nineveh because he didn't want the Assyrians in that city to get saved. And so we know the Jews really look down on the Gentiles and there could be a lot of tension there, just like there's tension in America and, and in Vietnam and in Hispanic countries. There's all kinds of interpersonal tensions, all kinds of racisms, we might say it today. All of that has been broken down and we are all one in Jesus Christ. And that's what the rest of Ephesians 2 goes on to say that you and I, we are all together for the gospel. No matter where we come from, we are united as one in Jesus Christ. So Ephesians 2, we're talking about some rich teaching about our salvation, both what God has done in our life as an individual soul and then what God has done collectively to join us all together. And when I see people at our church, I don't think about different categories. I definitely don't wanna ever see cliques or distinctions of groups in our church. I want us to see ourselves as one body, a one family of blood brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. So maybe just take a moment today and enjoy what God has given you, how he has made you alive in Christ in your soul how he's made us the body of Christ in our church, how he's put us here at this place, at this time, to pray for a revival and to seek it out in the Bible. Take a walk around, everybody, and look what God's doing. He's making things beautiful in his time. And we'll see you for more right here on Scripture of the Day.